One of our favorite independent media from the East, Robert Dorian and Chris Barber, one of Canada's heroes. Stay with us. Hello everyone and welcome to the beginning of the last days. My name is Laurel Lynn Tatter Thompson. One of my favorite things on this planet is being here every day live with you, live and in person. And uh, we've got a couple of great guests today, so it's going to be an incredible show. You've all been following what's happening with uh, Chris Barber and uh, Tamara Leach and uh, Lich. I always say her name wrong. Don't tell her, Chris. Um, and, uh, and we just love them. These are Canadian heroes that are standing up. And Robert Dorian, you know, we've got to support our independent media. These are the people that are boots on the ground watching what's happening because you cannot believe a word of what you are seeing on mainstream media. They are bought out. They are paid shills for the Liberal government. And uh, we hope that that government falls uh, soon. So one of, the, one of the pleasures I have in this lifetime is reading from my dad's Bible every day. He's, it's been over two years since he went to be to his, uh, he, he was uh, graduated to his new home in heaven. And I miss my dad every day. And uh, so I love to read from his Bible that he has marked up everywhere. And I try to find these gems that he underlined. And he never knew I would be doing this the rest of my life on this show. Uh, but he, he left me some guideposts. So this one is in Psalms 104. And it says uh, in verse 34 and 35, he's underlined, my meditation of him shall be sweet. I am glad in the Lord. Sometimes we're not glad in life, but we can be glad in God because God is, is giving us joy in spite of our circumstances. We don't need to be like on a winning streak necessarily to have peace and joy because that's coming. We trust in God and so we give it to him and we have that joy in spite of what we're going through. Then he says this, my dad has underlined this. Okay, I really like it. All right. Let the sinners be consumed out of the earth and let the wicked be no more. Bless thou the Lord, O my soul. Praise ye the Lord. Amen. I just love when David wrote about all those wicked and evil people being consumed and being no more, becoming dust behind him as he goes forward to victory. And that's what we're believing in these cases that have come against some of the people that have stood. Uh, we covered yesterday and on the weekend the, the case of James Sowry. Please pray for him. He's in jail for 10 months. So anyways, go back and see that if you'd like to get some more of the details on that. Um, I want to very quickly welcome Robert Dorian. Um, he's a French-Canadian out of Quebec that's been reporting various stories that the government and traditional media haven't been reporting ever since the original trucker convoy. His goal is to expose the government's abuse of power and overreach, informing the French Canadians about important subjects that are kept in the dark. Robert, would you please um, thank you very much for uh, being here today and uh, give us the down low on what's happening over there. I know you've got some thoughts on we're seeing that Lametti has resigned and some different things are happening. We'd love to hear your take on all of that. Well, first, thank you for having me again. It's a pleasure, like always. Um, yeah, there's so many things going on right now. At some point, it's a hard it's hard to, to decide what we're going to talk about or figure what you're, <laughs> you should be looking at. Um, but yeah, Lamenti uh, stepped down and then there's also uh, Thomas has stepped down. So I'm seeing, from my point of view, is the liberal government that's trying to get rid of anybody that could weigh them down in the upcoming um, procedures. We all know that Freeland uh, called to, wanted to go and appeal uh, following the, uh, the ruling from the federal court. Now, a lot of people in Quebec aren't really happy with that at all. They're, they're saying, and this is the chatter coming out of Quebec, is that if Freeland wants to uh, appeal something that the judge, a federal judge, has ruled as illegal and unconstitutional, they should pay out of their own pocket. 
why use the uh, Canadian taxpayers' money to go and appeal? And I, I've seen this uh, all over Quebec. People are upset with this. And I think they, uh, they're right in saying this. And, you know, Lamenti and, uh, and, and Thomas stepping down, and in my opinion, is uh, just another way of, of cleaning house so that they're not uh, associated, associated with the Liberal Party once they get back into court or if they get into any procedures. They, they won't have that same tie with them and they won't have these people weighing them down. Now, I've also heard about uh, Lamenti trying to delete his uh, ex account, which, is, uh, which, is ha which has a lot of information, a lot of emails that were and comments that were on that page that could be used against him should there be some legal actions. Uh, I've heard Ezra from uh, Rebel News talking about that. There's actually a movement trying to stop them from doing that. So, you know, there is something behind Lamenti leaving, and there's definitely something behind Thomas leaving as well. I, we might be seeing more of the Liberal Party uh, people disappearing in the next few days uh, following this uh, federal court judgment. Wow. Um, I hear that Lametti has restored his Twitter account after Ezra Levant basically, you know, uh, I don't know if it was a threat to sue or, or is, has initiated the paperwork saying, well, don't hide all your stuff because we're still going after you. We still want to know, you know, what you said, what was written in your, uh, you know, uh, private, uh, you know, letters or, or whatever. And so he put his Twitter back up. So that's interesting. Do you think it's just sort of a fall? I mean, uh, Justin Trudeau has made a real, uh, some very bad decisions. He's made a mockery of our Canada. We used to be known as the greatest place on earth. Like you, you don't want to travel as a United States person, but Canada, you're welcome everywhere. You're the land of the, you know, the free and, and, and you love yeah. people and you don't get in trouble and you don't go to war and, and you're good people. And now we become like the tyrannical nut jobs. And we're embarrassed of our country and we're putting people in jail. And we've got the Coots Four right now. We've got Chris Barber, who we're going to talk to, and, and Tamara that are on trial, ongoing. And James is just put in jail. And there are several others that are being tried. We've had tickets all over the place for not wearing masks. Um, you know, $2,000 tickets for not wearing a mask when we know the science is not behind that at all. I mean, our country has just really failed us. And I'm not certain that the, the people of Canada has, have also failed us because they failed to stand. Uh, many, many people failed to stand at an epic time. And who did stand was those who went two years ago. I was there in Ottawa. So were you. That was uh, yeah. some of the greatest times of my life in Canada. And, and I agree with that as well. I, I, what I saw down in Ottawa was the complete opposite of what every social, every uh, traditional media uh, legacy media was publishing on their their websites. Uh, they were talking about racist people. They were talking about white supremacists. They were talking about uh, people that hated women. Uh, and this ha was absolutely false in every sense of the word because there were plenty of women there. There were people from all over Canada, all the races, all the, we had French and English, and everybody came together in one of the most beautiful events I have ever been, if not the most beautiful event. I was literally so proud to be a Canadian at that moment in those streets, uh, exchanging with people from PEI, from BC, from uh, Alberta to you, we, we met some cowboys out from <laughs> from uh, Alberta and they were laughing at us, you know, yeah, you French guys, you're you're not that tough. And then we started exchanging it and ended up, we, we got to be buddies, you know, and it was cool and it was nice. And then you got all those legacy media smearing our, our, what we're doing and, and Trudeau throwing gas on, on the fire and, and lying. You know, this has been ongoing for two years. The lies just add on and then the, they doubled down on their position with uh, Freeland saying, you know, uh, at the moment we thought it was the right thing to do. No, you did not know that was the right thing to do. That is a fact. You never stepped out and even looked at what was happening because if they would have done that, they would not have come to that conclusion. And that is a fact. Nobody could step out into onto Wellington Street and then turn around and say, this is violent and these people are wrong. Nobody that actually took the time to be there could come to that conclusion. And that is where they are failing the Canadian public. They're lying through their teeth as to what was going down in those streets. Because I was there, you were there, so were Chris Barber and millions of other, other Canadians. And what we saw did not at all resemble what the legacy media were pushing on us. So, you know, we've got issues. We've got things to fix in this country. 
And yeah, and uh, I, we've got a way to go. They betrayed us. They betrayed us. They I mean, I never saw so many grown men crying. Um, huddles, prayer huddles everywhere. People singing worship music. People singing the Canadian national anthem. You know, freedom! We would yell, and then it would be echoed all the way down the street. I used to just love it. I mean, I felt so safe. It was so beautiful. And now, you know, the lefties, they're all triggered by the Canadian flag. Well, that's because they're on the wrong side of history right now, you know. And, uh, you know, they're all excited to, to just see tyranny come in and UBIs that are probably going to be attached to, you know, our digital, um, you know, footprint. And uh, our country is just heading into a completely communist and Marxist state. And the, the Freedom Convoy was fighting that. We were saying that we are sovereign people. Like, even if you don't believe in God, which you're entitled not to do in Canada, the thing about Canada is because it was founded on Judeo-Christian values, where it means that you get to have freedom, because that was actually God's idea. I mean, people might uh, think, you know, oh, oh, all this religious talk and all that. That's fine, but you better be thankful that our country was founded on the, the, um, the, sovereign, the sovereignty of God and the principles of this book. The principles of this book give you the right to reject God and live at peace, you know, till one day you, you face the judgment. But hey, that's between you and God. But you get to be free. You get to be Muslim, Sikh, Buddhist, Christian, Jewish, atheist. You get to do all that in Canada. And that's because we're founded on freedom. But they've taken our beautiful country. And uh, we saw the worst kind of tyranny. Canada was one of the worst people. I mean, after watching what was going on in Australia, we were terrified for those people. And then it happened to us. I didn't get to eat in a restaurant for months. Why? That was just hideous to do to us. They, they tried to force everybody, you know, that you had to go along with the medical mandate that, that they had. And, and it's proven to be a colossal failure. It never prevented you from getting you know, COVID, it never prevented you from passing it. And all of their plans and their assertions were false in the end. The Freedom Convoy was there to present this and you were there, we fought hard and now they're still making people pay and they're still gonna try to cover up. With this Emergencies Act, um, you were saying, you were telling me that actually some people sort of on the East Coast hadn't even heard about this incredible case with, uh, with Gersey's and um, uh, Eddie that we had on yesterday. Yeah, exactly. Like I, I was talking about the, uh, I'm not sure if the term is right, but the class action, I believe they're, they're coming up with a class action where, or uh, some sort of, 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 of procedure to uh, sue the government for X reason. You know, I'm not a lawyer, not at all. And it's even harder in English for me because I'm French to, 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 to word this properly using the right, the proper words. But I, I understand that the, what's happening is this, in my opinion, it's like a class action where uh, they're, they're, they're building this right now where we're the people that were, um, that suffered prejudice or, 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 or their accounts were frozen, which is, which is awful. Uh, they were making a great case with that yesterday about the impact that freezing people's uh, account had on Canadians, which is crazy. This is uh, absurd. Like the Americans, they, they, they couldn't believe something was like that was happening in Canada. And, and they were right about, about all that, like what's going on. So what I heard yesterday from Vince and Eddie is that something's going to be happening and people in Quebec, they know nothing about this because we're, our legacy media is all in French and God forbid they would ever, ever talk about something like that in Quebec. So that's why right. I'm working my, uh, my butt off trying to get that information across. And, um, and I'm not alone. There's a lot of other Quebec, Quebecers doing that. And, um, and there's a point I want to, you were talking about the measures early and, and the light turned on there because I think the, the purpose of me being here is sharing information out of Quebec that most of Canada might not know, just like I didn't know about Eddie and Vince and I will be sharing that information. But we had 6, 8, over 6,800 elderly people die in our CHSLD, which is an establishment, a, a government, provincial government funded um, uh, place, if you can call it that way, where older people go and they have certain treatments when they're they're not able to sustain their their uh, their, their life. Uh, now that's not the right word. What I mean is they can't they can't care for themselves, so they'll have people there to take care of them. I'm not sure how you call that in English, but we have that in Quebec. Over six thousand eight hundred of them, exactly. And there's different levels of this. You know, some people are still able to do their things, but there, there's always people that help them out. And it, it's on this, you know, 
the concept is excellent and it's it's worked good in Quebec for a long time. But during that pandemic and what we did in Quebec, 6,800, over 6,800 of them died in those establishments, not because of COVID, because they were not fed properly, because they not they didn't get water. Some of them were found with three diapers on because at that age it happens. It was a catastrophe. And now there's a class action that's been uh, a, a judge in Quebec approved class action. And there's going to be something with that on the legal side of it to see what really happened and who's responsible for this. This is a fiasco for Canada across the board. It's, you know, it's unbelievable. It really is. Like our elderly, our most vulnerable, you know, uh, except for those in the womb, you know, you've got the elderly and our, our, our children. These are the, the people who should have been protected and they weren't. Kids were forced to wear masks when they didn't even get COVID. And um, and then the elderly, they, they died alone. They couldn't see their loved ones. One day, if we don't fight now, one day we're that person. You know, God forbid, I always tell my kids, if you put me in a home, so help me God. But anyways, um, I, I'm insisting that they keep me there, right there. I want to be with everybody, you know, and die, die with my family. But, you know, not everyone can do that. And uh, my kids probably won't want me by then. But um, so you're in a home and then what do they do? You're at their mercy and, and they basically won't allow anyone to come and see you. And they, they, it, it was just appalling, you know, it, it was heartbreaking to see what happened. And on top of it, it was really the elderly that could get COVID and were most susceptible to some harms coming from it. My father got COVID. He was in the hospital. I went to the hospital and uh, I helped him get better because I gave him all the things that the doctors wouldn't behind their back. And that's how I got my dad out of the hospital. And I, I, they called security on me because I was a big mouth and a real problem. And I'm pretty proud of that. Um, but I did not want to leave my dad. It took a lot. Like it took my personality because not everyone has this. We're very polite Canadians. We're so polite that we allow all these things to happen. And tomorrow... Uh, tomorrow and Friday, I'm featuring uh, some people bringing grave warnings to Canada about a lot of things. And so please tune in tomorrow mm -hmm. and the next day as well. But uh, Robert, did you follow what's been going on then uh, with uh, in in light of the Freedom Convoy, what's been happening with Chris Barber? Do you think that uh, Chris and Tamara, do people in Quebec understand who these people are? Absolutely. Uh, the... the, the uh... The image they have in Quebec is that of uh, Canadian heroes. Um, a lot of, uh, a great deal of Quebecers uh, respect Chris and Tamara for what they did. Uh, they weren't the only people involved in this, but they seem to be the ones that are being uh, hammered real hard right now, you know, punished and used as an example. And Quebecers are not stupid. We see what the government's trying to do with that. They're making an example of these two uh, Canadians. Uh, who owes, who, who had the nerve to stand up to uh, Trudeau and his liberal and his tyrannical liberal party. You know, it's, I have to mention this. I hate it because in their, their party name, it says liberal. They are everything except being liberal. There's nothing about their policies that reflects the, the, that word, liberty. You know, liberal it should be everything about liberty. And nothing they're, they're so doing right now goes with that. They're, they're, it's ridiculous. So it, it, Quebec people absolutely know who Chris is and Tamara, and we follow as best we can with the limited information we get in, in, up in, in Quebec. And uh, but we know who they are, we know what's going on, and we wish them the best, and we're there to support them. Well, with that said then, thank you for your um, independent reporting, telling people the truth. Uh, it's people like you and I that are actually informing Canadians. Between you and I, we have saved thousands and thousands of lives. I've been told that over and over as I travel from province to province, you know, because you're giving the information that they're not hearing on the legacy media and we can't trust these guys. And so I appreciate that. And I'm so glad to hear that, uh, that Quebec is in support. And, you know, at least many of them would understand the price that Chris has, has had to pay uh, and Tamara. So Chris Barber, I know you're waiting in the background. We just welcome you and thank you so much for taking time uh, to come and to speak to us. It's a, it's just awesome to see you, brother. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me, Laura Lynn. It's good to see you again, Robert. It's been a couple of years, hasn't it? <laughs> it has. It has. Interesting years. Yeah, really Very interesting much. years watching the fallout.
Yes, Chris, tell us what's happening. Um, we hear that uh, you're still in court. How long, uh, how much longer is this going to go? Maybe you could just give us like the download, like give us the Reader's Digest or even a little bit longer than the Reader's Digest version from beginning to end of your involvement. Um, I have to tell you something, Chris. I mean, I heard about you when I was in um, Ottawa, but you weren't like, you know, it wasn't like, Chris is like the big boss. It was just like, Chris is a good guy. He's a hero, good, good person to interview. That's what I was told. And I was always looking for you and I couldn't find you most of the time. And I never went there because of you or Tamara. I went there because I heard so, some people were getting together to fight for us and head to our capital to, to stand for what's right. You know what I mean? So anything that would maybe be trying to pin, uh, you guys as being uh, disturbers in Canada, I don't buy it at all because I, I, I didn't even know who you were pretty much through the whole time. I got, I got to know that Tamara had started a GoFundMe, you know, and I heard at one point it was just to get her and her friends, uh, you know, to go. And then it just kind of, <clears throat> it went big. So let me give you just a few minutes to tell us about, like, give us sort of from beginning to, to and lead us up to today of what's happened. Well, as most people know, in uh, January of 2022, I did an infamous TikTok video out there saying that it was time to stand up. It was time to stand up against government tyranny and, and essentially put this government back in this place and take some of our powers back as Canadian citizens. And with that, Tamara Litch stand up with me. She called me about a week afterwards and asked me if I needed any help. And of course, we did at that point. We needed social media. We needed we needed a whole pile of help there. And it was just from there, this great gathering of minds came together, just a grassroots movement that just decided to flourish. So before that, I was the truck driver. I worked right through the pandemic. I, uh, I trucked the entire time. I wore my masks in the restaurants. I didn't want to be the guy that got a business owner a $14,000 uh, ticket in Saskatchewan for not wearing his, his mask in that establishment. So I was trying to be very mindful of, and of the businesses and the ramifications of that and the health officers that would come in um, when December of 2022 or 2021, sorry, came around. I, I became vaccinated in order to keep my job at cross-border trucking, but something didn't sit right with that. I felt really uneasy about it. And so when the opportunity came to stand, I was right at the front of the line there. Um, as most people know, Big Red, the, the truck over my shoulder there on the wall was the lead truck of the convoy all the way to Ottawa. Um, we led uh, approximately, what was it, 28 to 30 miles of traffic from, from the west to the east to send a message to the prime minister. And, uh, and it just, it snowballed from there. We created this uh, unbelievable movement. Um, there was no essentially a leader involved. A lot of the times uh, I was seen on the back roads within Ottawa, making sure emergency lanes were open and working with the public, making sure there was a lot of safety going on there. We were in a lot of the hotel rooms. We stood with Brian Peckford. He came all the way from, uh, from uh, Victoria or in an over in Naomo area where he is. He stood with us and, uh, and stood proudly with us. Um, there was a lot of big doctors that showed up. There was a lot of support all across this whole country. I know you were there. I, I've seen your reporting on the, on the air a lot. Um, there was, it was a collective group of amazing people that came together and it changed Canada and it changed a whole pile of people. And, uh, it just, I'm very proud of where, where we are. I know there is now, there's now two aspects to the legal side of the things for Tamara and myself. We are both co-accused. Uh, I have seven indictable offenses ranging from mischief to going against the court order to, uh, intimidation of a peace officer as well as four counseling charges on top of that. Tamara has six indictable offenses. We're, we're facing 10 years in uh, federal prison is what Tamara and I are facing. Our trial started in September of 2023, and uh, it was supposed to be a 16-day trial. It is now 33 or 34 days, and there's basically no end in sight. We are now moving into March 7th for a verdict for what they call the Carter application. If nobody knows what the Carter application is, basically, if uh, if one of us are found guilty of anything, we both will be sentenced with the same uh, a penalty. So uh, if Chris is found guilty of mischief, but Tamara is not, 
co-accused, we are we are going to be uh, charged or facing the same the verdicts. So um, after that, we will fifteenth, uh, fourteenth, and fifteenth of March, we will be back in court for more hearings, more motions, and we will start the defense side of our trial. So. I've never been in a police car in my my life. I've never been in handcuffs. I've never been in the in the judicial system um, until now. And I can tell you that I've met a lot of amazing people. And some of those people have been the lawyers that are representing us now. The other aspect to our our uh, our case is a four hundred million dollar lawsuit that was brought upon uh, leaders of Tamara and myself from Zexy Lee, an Ottawa city citizen residence, uh, and with Paul Champ being the the pro the lawyer behind that. So. We're working our way through the legal system right now as best as we can. Um, like I said, it's uncharted territory for me, being as I've never never been part of it. So we learn something new every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, um, I'll, I'll never forget this. Uh, you know, this is just one amazing moment. Uh, just being there together, standing, um, not even sure who all the players were at this time. I mean, I barely who knew who Tom Mazzaro was. And... Um, and, and then you sitting there, like, I, I didn't fully understand all of it. And I, I didn't see you as um, someone, you know, shockingly, is it because you drove the first truck? Like, what what is it that, that they singled you out? Well, I have a very, very vocal mouth on social media. One can say <laughs> that I, I really toned that mouth down in the last number of years, um, which is, you know, <laughs> I got, um, I've been very critical of the the federal government and some of the policies they've they've created in the last number of years. Um, um, just the way that they've they've found a way to divide this country. Um, over the years, you've always seen government interfere in people's businesses. You've you've seen government interfere in and in try and put a divide between people. They've divided east versus west for how many years? They've divided us over our nationalities or skin color. Um, and now they found a way to break into our households and divide families. I know families that didn't celebrate Christmas as a family this just past Christmas because one family member may have been unvaccinated or not. And even though they're, the science behind that is, is saying that that's not even a case anymore, the, the, it's still in people's heads. And it's created from the, from the government and the mandates that were brought into effect. So uh, I was very vocal on that, and I still remain to be very vocal against that. And fair enough. And, you know, even so, you said you actually, you participated, you got a vaccine. Um, mm -hmm. And, but you still, you said you felt like something's not right about that. I mean, how many should they be able to force people to take? That's the thing. My uh, my 18-year-old son, Jonathan, who uh, who's now running the trucking company that we own together, um, is unvaccinated. Jonathan, right from, from the start, held strong and... Uh, you know, just said that he wasn't going to get it. He didn't feel like it was his place to get it. His immune system was strong enough to handle the vaccine. And so this fight was more or less for my son or my family, uh, more so than my myself. I, 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 I guess I, I fell in with the rest. 90 or – the government likes to say 90% of Canadians is vaccinated. I call that – Malarkey. I, I would like to think it's more like maybe 60% per se. In the trucking industry, they like to use the same terminology that 90% of truckers are vaccinated. Man, the amount of people that reached out to me during this when, when the federal government brought the mandate in for the January 15th cross-border travel for commercial vehicle drivers, it was overwhelming to know that, that something had to be done, that somebody had to stand up against this. What was going to be next? And uh, I'll remind everybody that Marco Mendicino was talking about interprovincial check stops before those trucks went to Ottawa. So that was something that was going to be happening. And where were they going to stop? 100%. And, you know, I'm just um, thinking about uh, the, the did, did you sense that camaraderie when you were there? Like this beautiful movement of patriotism, the love of Canada. Like we really loved Canada and I'm kind of sad because I have to say that as we've watched what Trudeau has done, um, that, you know, it, it feels like something's been lost and now we're fighting to get that back and we keep fighting, but we're so upset by what they did. And you'll remember when they brought in the ugly suits. I have some video of that as well. Maybe you can put the two of us up. I'll see if I can find this. But um, we had, 
like the truckers moved out, if you'll remember, and they still came after unarmed citizens. They still like strong armed us. The truckers left because you guys did not want anyone harmed. And you know, it's it's like they they were treating everybody bad and so okay. And then I was out there while these ugly suits, which I still don't really know where they're from. Some people say here or there. I think they were from Quebec, but they had no name. And they came after us, shoving us. And one guy saved my life because there was nowhere left for me to go. I was at the front of the line being a bit of a big mouth myself. And, um, and there was nowhere to go. And some guy from the back reached in under my arms and literally pulled me because there, there was a snow drift. I was going to get crushed, literally. Just crush. Like, people did get hurt from, from their tactics. Unarmed citizens. We would get tired for Pete's sake. Let us have a day and walk the streets. You had to send in the ugly goons and, and strong arm us. You know what I mean? It was just ridiculous. So, so this guy saves my life. He pulls me, you know, back. And I'm like, oh, thank you. Thank you. I still don't know who that guy is, but I'm very grateful. He saw that I was in danger. But how did you feel at those final, the final... Uh, the final day or two when when everything ha had just not gone well and no one backed us? Well, there's obviously a reason why I was one of the first persons arrested and thrown in a jail cell. Um, you know, you, you promote the peace, love, the unity, and you live that for the total of three weeks. And then my eyes were closed for those dark hours because I was in a jail cell, an eight by wow. eight by five jail cell in the in the basement of Ottawa City Police, and there's a reason why I was there because I don't I don't believe that that God probably he didn't want me to watch that. You uh you just spoke about people crying and the amount of grown men crying, the amount of women crying, the amount of tears that were shed on on strangers' shoulders throughout those three weeks. People felt alive again. They felt like they could they had a community. They felt like like hope. they weren't alone. Hope hope and then the government came in with their boots and crushed us and uh you know i spent 26 hours in jail in in what they they call i guess they call the drunk cell in ottawa city jail it's it's a cold concrete slab in, in a jail cell with uh, they'll give you apple juice and orange juice but they won't give you a bottle of water and they give you sandwiches and uh, when i was released from that on bail my bail bond was $120,000. I was ordered to leave the city of Ottawa within 24 hours, and I was ordered to leave the province of Ontario within 72 hours. I was given conditions that I wasn't allowed to talk to the one person that, that, that joined me on that amazing journey, which is Tamara Lich, and we've had conditions against each other since for the last two years um, without legal counsel. So anytime we're near each other, we have to have lawyers present. We can't have a conversation without one. Yet we sit in trial for the last, you know, four months side by side in the first row of, of the courtroom. And, and there's some issues in this country and there's, there's some atrocities that have happened. And I think a lot of people are wanting retribution. They want, they want acknowledgement that things were handled inappropriately. And I think last week's decision with the federal judge was a good start with that. We're on our way for opening 2024 is a year of of, uh, of people opening their eyes and seeing exactly what's going on in this country we're going to fix this now wow i'm excited uh for you uh to i'm excited to hear how you feel about that that decision and i hope that that this judge's decision seeing that this was unfair or unconstitutional um was unnecessary um that this is going to bear well for your um for your court case. I want to bring in Robert Dorian. He is also, uh, we were speaking to him, he's French Canadian out of Quebec. And uh, you heard that they they have a love for you there. And I'm wondering if Robert has any questions for you, because we want to know how we can help you. First of all, um, you know, we hope that there is an end in sight to all that you're facing. And we hope that you're vindicated and that you're not going to jail for the most appropriate response of all time um and so I'll, robert i'll let you ask a couple questions because i've got some more too so what what do you think well uh like you said if there's anything we can do chris to help you and tomorrow and anybody else uh from day one when we were down in uh in ottawa when we when the cobbler was actually there 
uh, one thing that we realized is that we had lack of communication from coast to coast. That was obvious. And it's always been like, that's what's motivated me to participate in English uh, in my second language to talk and, and express what's going on in Quebec because there's, there's definitely a lack of this. So if there's any uh, platforms that we can help you with, uh, just share them with me and I will, I will do my best to pass them on in Quebec uh, with the people uh, and have them uh, try to give your, you guys a hand because it's, in my opinion, it's not just helping Chris and Tamara. It's fighting for the right things for the right values and purpose. Like Laura Lynn was saying in the book, at the beginning of her show, she's talking about the way this country, what, 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 did, what was the founding values of this country when it was built? We were built on honesty, hardworking Canadians with really good, found, uh, good foundation, good values. You guys stood up, you, Tamara, and everybody else that showed up in Ottawa, we stood up as a country, as Canadians, to hopefully get a message across to the government. You know, this could have stopped, and I said this before, if this would have been done in three days if Trudeau had stepped out and said, I hear you, you've come down here, you're, you've got something to say, we've heard you, we're gonna take that into consideration, thank you, now please leave, we're get, we'll get back to you. He never had the nerve to do that. That's what put everybody in this position. So standing up and helping chris and tamara and all of this is is also standing up for every, the right of every canadian a and and we should be backing you guys and we will be backing you guys 100 percent. appreciate that and that that's where unfortunately we've come up with this new term in canada whether it's new or old it's lawfare what they're doing is using the justice system against uh ordinary canadians that decided to have a stand um there's two different ways you can do it three technically i guess the justice center for constitutional freedoms is one of the ones that's partially backing me on my uh, my legal help with my lawyers in ottawa um, the democracy fund is helping tamara with her with her bid um, and the other one we're doing right now is is a, a direct uh, an e-transfer right to the lawyer's account um, if for people that want to donate directly to um, you'll see under my name there, there's a website called Big Red Merch. We have a website out there. It's it's the cartoon version of Big Red on hoodies, stickers. Um, if anybody's ever known my social media platform, you know there's a little dog that carry, that travels around with me wherever we go. His name is Zippy. And I'm surprised he's been so quiet upstairs. Usually he's a fairly loud guy upstairs if somebody's outside. So uh, that website, Big Red Merch, is where we sell. Uh, it's a website for the corporation, so you'll see a lot of the pictures of the trucks that we run, the equipment that we haul, and then on the side, there's a store where you can buy a, a Big Red hoodie. When you do that, you're supporting people. You're supporting my bid in uh, Ottawa for living expenses, for travel expenses, for meals, and then you're also I'm I'm putting that money towards other people's. There's there's a lady out there right now. Her name is Christine Declare. She was on Nicholas Street. She was arrested on the 19th of February. She was charged with, I believe, three indictable offenses. She was acquitted of all charges last year. Acquitted, everyone. And the Crown Prosecutor now is appealing that. And they're, they're seeking 90, I believe it's 90 days in jail for her on this appeal. So my lawyer, Dan, Diane Magus, in Ottawa has stepped up to the plate and she's representing Christine on this second appeal. Um, and there's more. I heard today that there's another guy that was on Nicholas Street. The Crown has offered him, you know, you're going to go to, to trial on March 24th. We'll offer you 90 days in jail, and uh, and you can take that. And so he's scared. A lot of people are scared right now. Harold Yonkers, Java. There's a lot of the truckers that took part in Ottawa that are still facing trial right now. So we can't forget about these people. I'm And I'm slowly learning about new people that need help, too. So whatever we can do we're trying to fund these people and fundraise we've got legal separate accounts we should almost have like a database put together with these people's names and the way to support them that's probably something we should be working on there's been a lot of the people that have slipped through the cracks unfortunately chris what did you think about the support of any members of government or parliament during our time there it was amazing wasn't it like we, we had leslin lewis who why you know an african-american lady in parliamentary system i love that yeah she's an amazing person she walked through there every single day and didn't feel uh any bit um 
in danger at any time. Anyone that you know that took part in the protests that stood in, in the streets of Ottawa during that time, they didn't feel any hate. They didn't feel any 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 anger or anything like that. It was a pure... You mentioned the Canadian flag a little while ago, Laura Lynn. Like, the Canadian flag is something that we've never looked at as high as we do now, I believe. I've spent a lot of time trucking in the United States. And I know every time you see that, you see that flag down there, the Stars and Stripes, you see it everywhere. The, the Americans hold that flag strong, and they're very, very proud of it. In Canada, we now look at our flag the same way, I believe. You see it on, uh, it, it's everywhere. When I travel the highway from Saskatchewan to Ottawa, and I've done that three times throughout the course of the last four months in trial, you see it everywhere. It's, it adorns the highways. And I got to tell you, anyone who has a Canadian flag on the highway or on their house or on their vehicle, it puts a smile on my face. It puts a, a smile on a lot of people's faces. So good. What about, do, do you have any more insight on the night when Parliament was supposed to meet? Um, this is when um, the then leader of the Conservative Party, uh, her name escapes me, JT, but uh, she, uh, Candace, Candace Bergen. So, and they were supposed to have a meeting for our protection. Do you remember that? And then that meeting never happened? I don't remember that. No, I don't remember Candace being very involved with anything there. They all seemed like they kind of hid back. Well, she told us to go home. Yeah, she told us to go home. Um, but they were there. Uh, I had heard on the street, you know, word on the street, like there's who knows who, what, who gets what word. But uh, the parliament was supposed to have a late night meeting. And this was right before they sent in the, the bad dudes that, that really uh, broke up everything. Um and uh and that that meeting never happened and i remember the next day going wow like okay we're in trouble nobody's actually standing up and then they said they're bringing you know they're bringing in the the heavy hitters and uh it's all over and i remember you know i was there and i i did a live when the truckers were packing up and it was teary and and it was a very difficult thing but we knew they're gonna hurt people so we've got to go. And of course, you had been taken off and incarcerated. Um, so it, it was hard. But when I when I remember that first day, were you there that first day? I mean, you must have been somewhere in this crowd that you're seeing here. Uh, million. I mean, I heard that there was over a million people. I don't know because I couldn't count that high. But it, it was really incredible to see this crowd. This was, I believe, day one. I, I think it was day one. I have a video I found on my phone the other day uh, in my memories, and I was standing on the stage with Tamara and uh, a few other people, and I panned the crowd on both sides, down, back, and in, in straight forward on Wellington there, yep. and uh, it brought chills to my spine. The amount of people <laughs> there was just, and it was, it was... It was life changing. Like let's say it like it is. I'm I'm this small town Saskatchewan boy who's, you know, lived in the cab of a truck for life. But but living that experience for me, I like to always tell people that I don't think there was a person in that crowd there that grew more than Chris Barber in those three weeks. I it was a spiritual awakening for me. There was there's I didn't realize that Canada could do that. It's it made me I I I cried a lot, like, and I still cry when I watch videos of that. It the emotions come back and they hit you, right where it hurts, and that's it, where it makes you happy, really. Well, this was the small fringe minority, I guess, that uh, decided to come out. Tell me about uh, when when you were driving down the highways, because uh, at first, uh, I was there in Delta, British Columbia, seven thirty a.m., and we started it. Okay, and I was with all the truckers, and I filmed, and I just didn't know. Then we came to the first overpass and I'm looking through the fog going, what are all these people doing out here? And then we got to the next one and it was getting brighter and brighter because the sun was coming up. And by the time we got to the third or fourth overpass, you've got hundreds of people waving flags. And I'm like, who are these people? How did they even know? How did they even know? Were they watching my show? <laughs> you know, I was like, who are these people? And then, so we keep, we keep going. And then all across Canada, millions of Canadians just from the street, they couldn't get to Ottawa, but they were there to support you guys. What did you think of that? 
there was a lot I couldn't hold my emotions in. It started in Redcliffe. I woke up on the morning of, of January 24th. I uh, I had plans. To, I lived north of Swift Current on a farm. And so Big Red was sitting in the shop ready to go all deckled up and ready to fly. And, and I told everybody, hey, uh, that Monday morning, let's 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 meet at the co-op card lock parking lot in Swift Current. And let's go to Medicine Hat. We'll pick up Miss Leach. We'll uh, meet the West Convoy. We'll organize there. And then we'll start heading east. I came around, I was nervous, like very, very nervous. My wife did a, a video of me leaving the yard in the dark, you know, Big Red's lit right up all over. And uh, and I remember telling that I'm going to make you proud. And her comment back was, you already have. Mm -hmm. And uh, she posted she posted that, that video out online. And I left with, uh, with the family at home, my son Jonathan in the truck, coming around the corner in Swift Current that morning. And you seen all the vehicles lined up in the card lock parking lot waiting to go to Medicine Hat. And you're like, it's the anticipation because we've been waiting for like the, the three weeks going, is anybody going to show up? I got phone calls from friends saying, you know, why are you doing this? It's not going to work. It's never going to work. And I said, if everybody has the attitude like that, you're right. It's never going to work, but it did work. And medicine hat, when we came through, there was traffic control. There was the, the city police were blocking off intersections so we could get through the intersection safely. People were adorning the highway with flags uh, out in the middle of nowhere, Saskatchewan. Of course, Zippy's going to have to be loud now. Of course, he's upstairs. That's okay. No, it's not yeah. bad. And it was the entire direction across Canada. Manitoba, Winnipeg, uh, Headingley, Manitoba, would, it still in my mind takes the cake for the amount, the most amount of people on the highway, around the perimeter, and for about 30, yes. 30 miles east of Winnipeg. It was just And it was 40 surreal. below. It was 40 below. It was cold. <laughs> And they were out there for hours waiting for us. And that's when I got a fur coat from a wonderful, um, uh, you know, First Nations lady. And she said, it's going to be cold and you're going to need this. And I'm like, oh, I don't know if I should wear a fur coat. Then I found out why God made fur coats, because they keep you warmer than anything else. So, um, you know, recently you were at uh, Tucker Carlson. And if we could bring uh, Robert back in, I want to get the impression you guys have of, you know, um, we, we saw... So we gathered in, there was Calgary and Edmonton, and I heard over 10,000 people between the two venues were there. What did you think, uh, Robert, I'll start with you, because these were freedom-loving people, the, the small fringe minority from the Alberta area that showed up to see Tucker Carlson, who really um, highlighted this incredible Freedom Convoy 2022. Yeah, absolutely. The fact that Tucker Carlson, now, now for anybody who doesn't know who Tucker Carlson is, you have to take into consideration that this, this uh, news anchor, ex-news anchor from Fox, who's, who's spent his whole life in uh, journalism and a very uh, important and renowned uh, American, um, he took out of his time, took his time to come up to Canada. Oh now, he's already got 11 million people following him. So, he uh, he comes up here to Canada and and speaks out against what's going on with Trudeau and the fact that uh, he's basically uh, turned into a dictator. And what I found interesting is that he didn't have to do that. He's got nothing to gain by doing that. He's already famous, and it's not money. So I think he did it out of his heart, trying to come up here and really waken the Canadian people as to what was going on. His message was very clear. He says, you need to wake up and realize what's going on right now in your country because uh, this is outrageous. You know, you're losing your liberties and you're just standing by and letting it happen. So I, I thought it was very insightful, very interesting. Uh, Tucker Carlson's always uh, very, uh, a very colorful uh, personality and he did not <laughs> miss his chance to uh, come down on Trudeau and Freeland. And, and a lot of Canadians appreciated that. Uh, the liberals were freaking out, you know. You've got uh, Stephen Bilbo freaking out with uh, what's his name there, Pablo Rodriguez, and, and they're all upset and then calling on. They they have that that knack to flip it around and say, "Well, where's Poliev? You should have said something." No, no, no. This is your problem. This is your can of worms. You deal with this. You brought this on yourselves. You've acted a certain way. You've stirred up so much shit through the language that you've got somebody from the States willing to come up here and say something about it. So deal with your problem, fix it, and maybe you should look in the mirror and realize that you're not doing what you're supposed to do. comes back to what I was saying, you know, where's the liberal in all of this? It's, it's, it's awful.
But I'm very yeah. glad that somebody like Tucker Carlson would come up here and speak out against it. Hats off to him. I, I love the guy. He's he's great. Yeah. What what did you think of that night? Uh, I saw you there, Chris, and um, it it was just so great to see an entire stadium full of people that still get it. We're still here, you know. There was uh, there was ten thousand people there. And uh, we were down on the floor there in front of the stage, and it was just surreal to look up at the sta- the crowd on all sides of you and think, you know, th- this is this is a movement that's still gaining momentum. There's a lot of people here. We needed that sort of a night as an inspirational night. Tucker, of course, like you said, Robert, he, he hit the federal government, Justin Trudeau, where he, where he needs it. He talked about MAID. He talked about the MAID that's coming in against our children and the fact that the federal government wants to play God essentially now. Um, and in the politics aside, and then you watched, of course, you watched the federal government, the, the cabinet members gaslight and try and turn this into something it wasn't. I didn't hear any negative rhetoric from Tucker. All I heard was truth. And uh, I was so happy to finally sit down and see him live. I was on a show during the convoy. Tucker had us on the show um, once there. It was, a, it was a, a moment probably I'll never forget driving down the highway outside of North Bay and getting a phone call from a New York area code on my phone and, and answering it hearing, hi, this is Samantha with the Tucker Carlson show. And uh, we knew kind of it was a big deal at that point. Tucker was very, very vocal for us on American on the Fox News Network. And, and that was part of the reason why the word got out. The Canadian media would have covered this up as fast as they could have possibly could have, right? Absolutely. Um, somebody in the comments right now, we've got a really large audience watching, by the way, people love you and uh, just really so grateful calling you a hero. Um, but uh, they said Conrad Black was uh, a little bit confusing because he, you know, Tucker put Christia Freeland down, the entire place erupts with claps. Conrad Black feels he has to somehow defend Christia Freeland. So I guess there's a friendship there. He felt he had to, I don't know. That's the good thing about Canada, right? Where everyone's entitled to an opinion. I was caught off guard with a little with Conrad's Black. I've never really listened to him speak, so I wasn't sure what to take from him. Um, yeah, he was very defensive on the city of Toronto and uh, Christine Freeland. So, and and Tucker gave a good argument back. So it was a it was a really good, interesting evening uh, listening to Jordan Peterson. What I really enjoyed too is the fact that Daniel Smith came out and spoke beforehand, and she gave a very powerful speech about. Alberta being, you know, in, in a position of power right now and willing to be a partner with the U.S. in trading its uh, energy. Yeah, Danielle <laughs> Smith, uh, you know, we all have high hopes that she's going to do the right thing. I wish she would be more vocal for the Coots 4. And uh, recently, Leighton Gray is basically saying, listen, we got we got a justice problem here. We need people that support us. We need people that are, you know, actually have the ability to um you know to to be a voice to actually bring you know let let the pressure be felt by the justice system that people are watching and we want justice proper justice we have the coots four that have been sitting in a remand center for over 700 days if they've done something wrong then get them into trial try them find them guilty or not guilty let them go or put them in jail period one of the two uh, remand centers like purgatory for the jail system it is absolute hell um, these boys have been sitting there long enough you have the james sowery story as of yesterday where james is now sitting in a, in a federal prison for the next 10 months for basically running over a pylon with a truck near the coots crossing 10 months in jail this is a father this is a guy that owns his own business um he's now gone for for seven months and uh What's the justification for it? What the penalty in the criminal code should be in the public's best interest. And how is that in the public's best interest to put somebody in jail for 10 months? 100%. Well, if I could add something to that, standing here in Quebec, what we're getting uh, as feedback is that they were putting all of the uh, the, the, the attention on the, the weapons cache that they found at Coots. I had friends from BC uh, that I actually made down uh, while the convo was happening. And... He came back to me about the coots and he said those weapons and i'm not understating what he told me he seemed to have concrete information on this that what we were seeing on the news and what was being told was uh, and shown those weapons had been seized at least a month before that event and that uh, they were laying that on the coots 
the people and, and that might be like standing here i'm not a, a lawyer or a judge or anything like that but if they had that hard evidence of all these weapons it would not have taken 700 days to try them they would have been front page a long time ago and the fact that they turn around and, and charge somebody for 10 uh for 10 months going to jail for running over a cone here in quebec the only thing you're going to say is that he was found guilty and then that cash weapon will come with that charge and everybody that doesn't take the time to look at this are going to say oh they did have weapons he was found guilty and now he's going to jail when in fact what you're saying is that he was considered as uh, from our understanding from my point of view was his truck was considered a weapon and he ran over a cone with it which was dangerous driving with the people there and that's why he's actually going to jail so there's a big difference between having guns and threatening the security of the people and the police and running over a cone and being negligent with your vehicle and that needs to be said but they're never going to say that they're going to leave that out there hanging there with that ominous on ominous uh cash weapon uh of cash of weapons hanging over this whole thing which is actually to me right now looks like a, a crock of bull you know none of that seems to be sticking so there's definitely something behind this and it's it's very bad because the people looking from afar how can we respect the system, the justice system when they're doing this when like like chris was saying they've weaponized our justice system that is bad very bad yeah and you know i do appreciate tucker carlson because he is uh this is uh james sowry here and i got the full story from him this last saturday so that's on my facebook and i'm gonna create a little video out of it but also uh tucker carlson has covered uh the guys in coots and uh, i was trying to see if i could get this up here but um he he's covered uh the the four gentlemen and has basically i mean you know they had as as much guns as uh, some guy in texas you know um yeah it a lot of guys um have guns for hunting and all kinds of things i mean you can just you put out those charges and then you silence everybody so everyone's like oh conspiracy to kill rcmp we we actually don't know uh the facts on any of this because we can't get them to trial in a in a fair way i'd like to ask you chris if you feel that so far are you and tamara being handled fairly i believe we have a judge in ottawa her name is heather perkins mcfay she is uh, seems very reasonable i i quite like her she's listened to both sides very fairly um, if anybody's been in the courtroom, our courtroom is not sealed, so we're not allowed to obviously talk about disclosure and that, but a lot of the evidence that they've thrown at us has all been social media posts. Uh, my my Big Red uh, 1975 five TikTok account, uh, any Facebook posts, the Freedom Convoy uh, Facebook page, and any media releases that we did. So there was no, no threats uttered. There was no, you know nothing uh it and basically it's just it just comes down to that sort of thing i'd like to add that the one thing with the coots boys none of those weapons that were were recovered are, are allegedly illegal weapons they're they've all properly registered rifles and they were found miles away from where the coots uh protest was happening so it leads a lot of questions the court has been sealed there so they're not allowed to to disclose dis discuss anything that comes in or out of that courtroom so right okay so and and as you were saying, um, how, how long yet uh, till you think that you get judgment on this? Still, we're still in defense. We're not even into defense yet. So oh, March, okay. like I said, middle of March for their next days in in court in Ottawa. Uh, we will hopefully be then able to to secure another. We need about another five days after that, uh, apparently. So we'll be we'll, we'll be booking probably into spring, if not summer. We might uh, we might get a verdict by next fall, possibly. Do a you year, think a year from? Do you think that judges? I mean, judges in Canada. Am I correct, JT? They are appointed by the government. Hmm. So yeah. So there would be tremendous pressure on them. I mean, I don't know how to find out which judge is appointed by who, but of course they're there to be fair and impartial. Um, but it just seems that the justice system has not been fair and impartial in Canada. And we're really struggling. We, uh, you know, we're really, really struggling to, to, to understand some of the decisions that have been made and the lack of justice. And finally, one judge, this, this man, uh, we're just so grateful for this judge 
that basically said that the federal government was uh, going beyond their reach and that it was unconstitutional what they did in initiating the Emergencies Act. And uh, I think that's what we all believe. So maybe there's a sign and hope for the future. We need that. I'd like to remind people too, like uh, out of bank accounts being seized, my corporate account was frozen. My joint bank account with my wife was frozen. Credit cards are frozen. And my Toronto Dominion personal bank account was frozen for just about three and a half months. So wow. hmm. that's crazy. That was, uh, that was uh, yeah. And, and that's Canada. That's a free country. That's because somebody chose to stand up against government tyranny, government overreach. And this is the punishments they hand at you. Instead of having a conversation with you like a normal leader would have done when that many people show up on your doorstep in a, in, in Ottawa, yeah, where you go to protest your, your sitting government, instead of having a conversation, we had name called. They, he, he, hmm. he mislabeled us, he turned the media against us, and he turned it into something that it wasn't. And if I, if I'll, I will die fighting for the rest of my life to make sure people know the truth of what actually happened in Ottawa for those three weeks, and it was everything positive positive, loving, and caring, the fame, the, the Terry Fox statue, like wh what Canadian wouldn't want, wouldn't want yeah. to hate you if, if the government told you that, so. Uh, absolutely. That's what actually, I, there's the that's Terry, what uh, actually picture. broke me. Mm -hmm. Right, go ahead, Robert. That's what broke me. I, I was sitting at home when I saw that, and it was out, coming out of the House of Commons, and I saw it live when it was an NP, NDP uh, uh, MP or, or whatever saying that we had desecrated the, uh, the Terry Fox monument. And I'm like, I was there today. And I, I had never done a live on any political subject or anything like this before. And I, I, I turned to my girlfriend and says, I was there today. And I didn't see any of that. So, and, and they were spewing lies and saying how we did this had to be taken under control and the government had needed to act because we were were basically animals and i'm like this is a lie and i went there the next morning and that was actually the first time i did a live about the uh about the convoy on that morning and i had a, i met a gentleman from new brunswick and he was scraping ice off the the side of the road beside the terry fox monument and i'm like well, why are you doing that and he's like well we're going to keep the place clean and he was a trucker from uh, new, new, uh, um, new brunswick and, and then he started talking and explained why he was there. And he said, they locked up my grandmother, which was my last living relative, and she died in the hospital alone, like an animal, like a dog, and I couldn't even say goodbye. So he says, that's why I'm here. And he pointed to the Parliament Hill, Parliament Building, Central Block, and he's like, they are the people that kept me from seeing my grandmother, and they, will, they have to answer that. We want accountability. And I was like, wow. And then Terry Fox Monument was full of flowers and had women there and men cleaning the statue and making sure nothing was on it. And yeah. then I, I stood back and I look at the monument. I'm like, okay, they're saying somebody urinated on it. And I'm like, who in their right mind would do that in the middle of the place? This is this is this is in the middle of Wellington or, or right off of Wellington, in the middle of, of plain sight of everybody. Nobody in its right mind would actually bear themselves that way and urinate on a statue. Nobody that, that is, doesn't have a mental issue would do that. You know, that's crazy. So I'm like, this is lies from the beginning to the end. They're lying. And they're trying to get the public to support them and what they're doing. And I, f I found that to be very um, awful. <laughs> I, I'm not sure what word to use of this. Unbelievable to see politicians spew lies like that in the House of Commons and, and, and expect us to believe them after, you know. And actually, that's... Like I said, that's where, that's where I drew the line. I said, that's it. I'm going to be doing everything I can to show, show what's really happening here. If, if this I whole could, thing is a mess, you know? It, it really is a mess, and I have another share of some some uh, visuals here. But, um, Chris, um, do, you, do you feel that there is misrepresentations that were done in the media that is now part of the assault against you? You know, that, um, that uh, they're, they're using incorrect media coverage that is being brought against you I, i'm wondering if that's happening not not in the criminal sense uh in the social media aspect i've heard a lot of ridiculous statements made about me um yeah there was a lot um just about <laughs> look at the way they portrayed us in the media you've got the blue collar canadian workers that finally stood up with no union to back us and you look at how the government used the media against us 
Um, we'll go over some of the stuff like the Terry Fox statue desecration was one of them. Urinating on the war monument was the other one. Um, uh, raiding the shepherds of good hopes, um, the, the, the shelter and stealing food from it. Lord, you guys were both there. There was one thing we had an abundance of. It was food. Um, to yes. this day, I would love to know what member of Ottawa City Council or the government or of who ha owns a Nazi flag. Somebody came out of the Chateau Laurier with right. a Nazi flag on a pole and walked it through the crowd took their photos that they needed for the media propaganda and then ran back in the building before anybody could hold them accountable. Somebody in that city owns a Nazi flag and I'd like to know who. Right. Taken by Trudeau's uh, photographer was later shown, <laughs> you know, like this, uh, this was all just a pile of nonsense to try to, you know, to m make it seem, you know, what it wasn't. And so, wow, this has been fantastic. Um, Chris, I just, I just want you to know a lot of people love you on the feed. Thank you very much for all the love that's pouring out to you. We want you to know that you're considered a hero. Uh, please give our love and respect to Tamara. And we're praying for you. We're praying that this process brings the truth. And you know what? It, maybe it's hard that it's taking so long, but maybe that's not such a bad thing. Because the longer we go... The more truth is revealed, the more time there is for everybody to understand what really happened here. And maybe time for Trudeau. I mean, how long until we get rid of, let me show you uh, one thing here. I got a quick share here, JT. Trudeau's holiday travel didn't break the rules. Ethics commissioner tells MPs. I mean, nothing Trudeau does gets him in trouble. Nothing Trudeau does of all the scandals, SNC Lavalin, uh, you know, um, the the we the we charity was it, um, all kinds of things that this guy does, including pretending to be happily married, which I personally find an affront because we knew it was a sham. I mean, he'd go to kiss her in public, and she would literally recoil with disgust, and we're all like, "What's going on with that marriage?" And you know, you find out that she's repartnered, moved on. Uh, had an affair, but nothing that, that, uh, and I would have thought maybe he was the one because, you know, he's seen with a certain blonde quite often, but the thing is, he, he has, he's driven our country into a dis disastrous state, even economically, and he just seems to get away with it, and it is time for him to go, and I would prefer not to have to wait until it's an election, and, you know, God help Jagmeet Singh, who's basically enabled uh you know a a criminal in my opinion so this would be brian over peckford. brian peckford told me this that usually when a when a par member of parliament uh becomes in trouble with an ethics violation and is found guilty on that which justin trudeau has been found guilty multiple times of ethics violations they're to step down and elect somebody new justin's one of the ones that uh, he seems like mr teflon boy it just seems like it flows right off of him yeah, you yeah. have to wonder where's the money, right, Robert? Go ahead. Oh, absolutely. Like, there are all kinds of numbers coming out that his fortune was about, he was worth about eight, eight million or so when he started into politics eight years ago. And now uh, numbers seem to be indicating that he's over 90 million. Now, how could you get from eight to 90 million in, in approximately seven years? Uh, there are things that are pretty sketchy about all of this. And you were talking about Jack Main Singh. Now, this, this is probably the key piece of this whole catastrophe is this lying, tre treacherous person. He's lying, and he lied to his constituents, the people who voted for him. He said that he'd be there to represent their interests, and all he's done is, is allowed a, the liberal government to continue. If he would have stepped up and been a real leader, he would have broken this illegal um coalition a long time ago and let the canadian uh, canadians vote for the right people to be there and maybe that would have shifted uh I, I'm, I'm certain that trudeau would have been bumped out by his own party and somebody else would step up and maybe you know there's one thing that i, I talk a lot about politics in quebec all the time and i think some people think i'm, I'm, I'm against the liberals and i don't believe in their philosophies or that's not true I, i'm not conservative i'm not liberal i'm not a, i'm there for the right leader and I'm there for the well-being of our country. That's who I vote for. Somebody who's putting forward good values and, and good in, and taking into consideration consideration the interests 
of every Canadian, no matter where you're from. And we're not getting that at all right now. We're seeing a government that's fixated on uh, only a certain part of the society, the more the wealthy part of the society. He obliges, obliges by, he doesn't respect any of the rules, obviously, like you were saying, he's been caught up in so many scandals and he doesn't have the morals to step down once he gets caught. He, he'll just brush it off, like you were saying, like Teflon Don, you know, it doesn't matter, it doesn't apply to me. I'm over, I'm, I'm way over all of you and I will keep going on as long as I want. That's not how it works in this country. And, he, you know, it's too bad that the N NDP are just letting this happen because they are really the ones responsible behind all of this. It could all end tomorrow if Jacqueline Sin stepped up and represented his constituents. I'm not sure if that's the right word, constituents. People have voted for him and, yep. and, and would just say that enough is enough. We're done with this. You're out, Trudeau. Let's have an election and, and let's see who does best for a country. Who's got something to offer better than this fiasco, you know? Yes. It's just, it's got to stop. Well, just remember Teflon Don, Don Gotti, eventually Don. it was yeah. uh, John Gotti. Uh, he, eventually, he got his uh, he got his due justice. We just watched that on uh, Netflix. Uh, we watched his life story, and I love watching you know true life stories. I love true life crime. I like uh, studying sort of historical things. But um, Chris, we wish you well. We bless you. Stand strong. Please give our love to Tamara. Thank you, Robert Dorian, for joining us from the East Coast. So basically, the West to the East loves you guys. And we support you. You're like you're like a Chris sandwich today between BC, uh, you know, on the west, and uh, all the way in Quebec on on the the far left of your screen there. So uh, take care, Chris. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really love you. We honor you, and we're praying for your justice. I appreciate you having me on today, guys. It's good to see you. Keep up that good work. We're uh, we're fighting the good fight. So thanks again. Thanks again. Thank you. Good luck, Chris, and say hi to Tamara. Wishing all you guys the best. Thank you. We will. God bless. Take care, God guys. Bless. Thank you. Bye bye. That was super fun. <clears throat> so, a um, couple things going on. Let's remember to always pray for these guys for justice. You know, even in your nightly prayers um, and and around the dinner table, it's not a bad thing to teach your kids uh, that you're praying for those who are standing up for our country. These are, this is the modern day war. You know, it's not, it's not with guns and, you know, flying, uh, whatever you call those flying airplanes in the second world war. Yeah. Fighter jets, you know, bombers and all that. It's not, it's not that kind of war right now. It's a war of words. It's a war of freedom. It's a war for our country to maintain the sovereignty of the individual for the people. It's that war, and that's the, the war that Chris is up against right now. And I just appreciate Robert, um, his heart. He's an awesome guy. Like, he is, he's taking what he heard on our show, was it yesterday, with, uh, you know, Vince Ger Gersey's and uh, Eddie Carell, and he's taking, Cornell, he's taking that information, and he's sharing it now with Quebec in the Quebec language. And this, this difficulty of the French-Canadian... That's not always going to be there because, as we know, AI can translate our words and our likeness into French. So, I don't know. We'll see how long uh, that we're all apart. I wanted to share this. Despite Emergencies Act vindication, do you see my share there, JT? Conservatives shouldn't deviate from message discipline, says the politicos. Um, so, uh, what are they basically saying? Despite the Liberals' vow to appeal last week's federal court ruling rejecting the government's defense of its Invocation of the Emergencies Act nearly two years ago, conservative strategists say the opposition should keep their eye on the future and the issues that are bringing them success in the present rather than uh, relitigating the past. Uh, I actually don't believe uh, that that's correct at all. I think this guy right here, front and center in your screen, right there, Pierre Polyev. Um, <clears throat> it was a, a very sad showing, as Chris kind of mentioned, about uh, you know, seeing seeing you certainly uh, weren't there, not very supportive. You have been more supportive as you found out how, you know, popular it is. But I just say, listen, Pierre Polyev's going in. So I do hope that he is watching this trend, that he's keeping an eye on the Chris, uh, the Chris uh, Barber case, and that he's keeping an eye on Coots. Isn't he from the Alberta area? Or, 
originally, yeah, grew up there. And that, uh, that Pierre Polyev will uh, stand up for these guys, uh, do some pardons, I don't know, come in and help out, help out the clan. Uh, we really appreciate it because we're your people and we want to see you standing for us. Now, I know you have some goodies here, JT. Tucker Carlson with veteran Joe Kent on the insanity descending upon Washington, D.C. I'd uh, like to show you this. Take a look. There's something bigger, it seems to me. I have no evidence, but just watching. There's like a spirit of insanity or delusion that's descended on Washington. It's almost like ergotism or something you read about in the Middle Ages where the whole village goes crazy and commits cannibalism. I mean, here you have for just one example. John Cornyn, who's a senator from Texas, whose state is being invaded by millions of people. You can't get your child into the NICU in Texas hospitals. You can't use the emergency room in Texas hospitals because they're full of people breaking our laws from foreign countries. So Texas is collapsing under the weight of this. And John Cornyn's entire day is spent worrying about the territorial integrity of foreign countries. It's like, how do you, how do you explain that? It can't just be payoffs from Lockheed, or maybe it is. I don't know. What do you think? I mean, I think a lot of it is this deeply entrenched mentality in Washington, D.C., which most certainly has financial interests assigned to it. However, I do think there is a lot of people and a lot of them, like you pointed out, like Nancy Pelosi, are in their 80s and they've always thought this way, this with us or against us mentality that says like, hey, you're either for the next war, the most current war and the current thing, or you're with the terrorists. You, you just uh, are kowtowing to Vladimir Putin. It's the exact same mentality that got us into the Iraq war. You're either with us or you're with the terrorists. And look, Tucker, I would love to come on here and defend neoconservatism as someone who you know lost my late wife in these wars, as somebody who lost countless friends, as somebody who fought myself 11 combat deployments. I spent most of my 20s and 30s in Iraq. I would love to tell you it had worked, but it simply did not. And that's a very hard thing to admit. I get into yes. arguments all the time uh, with fellow veterans about this exact same topic. So I think a lot of this is literally the gambler's fallacy. There's a lot of people who think, hey, yeah. if we just keep trying, if we keep attempting to spread freedom through the barrel of a gun and trillions of US dollars, this time it's gonna work. Let's just double down. And this is, well, how really nice casinos are built in Las Vegas off of this exact same mentality. So if any of you have seen what's going on in that southern border, uh, we had an incredible lady on um, and um, uh, sh she was telling us that there's a convoy. The convoy is literally going on right now. It's going from Virginia State through to Texas, uh, Arizona and California, where on February 3rd, this Saturday, there is going to be a massive stand for the border of the United States of America. And um, we, we had these guys on. I'll see if I can uh, get any of the, um, the footage that was uh, happening. If I show you this, JT, if you can put on this, uh, share this tab here. But uh, these guys, um, is that Robert Dorian again? Yeah. We had, yeah, we had him on that day as well. So here's what's happening in, in, uh, in, in the, in Texas is that these guys and this lovely lady, uh, she is, you know, in one of the convoys and she's reporting it on her podcast and her broadcast. And I just really appreciate that the Americans are now doing something they learned from us. They're doing a convoy. <laughs> they're taking their big trucks. The only difference between their convoy and ours is they're packing. Okay. All of them got guns. All right. And uh, we, we pray for a safe, because what they're saying is, this lady right here is saying, this is going to be a safe, uh, Kim uh, Yeeter is her name, and this is going to be safe, this is going to be um, uh, a great stand, because the Americans, they're watching, millions of people have poured in over their open border. So now Texas, uh, Texas governor has said, no, we're not allowing this anymore. We're, we don't know what the heck Biden's doing, and this is it right here, is this uh, peaceful convoy, southern border convoy. At February 3rd, they're going to end up at uh, Eagle Pass, Tucson, Arizona, and San Diego, California. They're not going near the border, uh, but they are going to um, stand you know, away from there. The, nobody's shooting anybody. There are concerns about a false flag of some kind, you know, uh, taking place, but 
other than peaceful Americans who love their country and think this is a travesty that Joe Biden, what is wrong with him? You know, what the heck is wrong with these people that they think it's okay to just allow millions of uh, illegals into the country? Just come on in. And then, you know, when some of these guys are coming into there, they're changing the, the, the voting, you know, this is why they're doing it, because they want to give all of these illegals the right to vote. Oh, they love Joe Biden. Hail Joe Biden. He's always such a nice man, you know. So, so he doesn't have any other way to win. They're bringing in all these illegals, and they want them to vote for the, the Democratic Party. Well, you know who's not too happy with that? The people who came to America the legal way. And they are people of color. They are people that have come from another country to get there. But they did it legally. Well, in droves, they're not happy about this. Because these illegals, they're bringing in crime. Do you know what they did in Mexico? They, they let everyone out of their mental institutions. They're letting their prisoners out. Oh, head to the border. Let it be America's fault. Problem. You know? And now, when... When these um, governors take people from these southern states and they put them on buses and they drive them up to Martha's Vineyard or they drive them up to New York State, well, everybody's having a meltdown now because all these lefties who are saying, oh, yeah, let them all in, you know, oh, well, we're overwhelmed. And you heard what Tucker was saying there. They they do not have, um, they, they do not have the... Uh, the ability to handle this in their in their hospitals. They do not have ability to, to take anyone in who even lives there because all of the illegals, I guess, they, they need help from the hospital. They're probably getting free health care while they're in. You know, cell phones and money, I don't know. It's just an absolute travesty. Um, I want to, all right, uh, CPC, so back to Canada, MP Michael Barrett is talking about how 76% of contractors who worked on the Arrive Can app did no work at all. Another scandal by the Liberal government and our Prime Minister. Damning news from the procurement watchdog about Trudeau's $54 million Arrive Can app. 76% of contractors who are supposed to have worked on this boondoggle did no work at all. None. More than three quarters of the contractors. This is the same Arrive Can app, the $54 million Arrive Can app that had the two person uh, IT middleman firm of GC Strategies receive $11 million. This is absolutely unbelievable. So think about the cost of all of Justin Trudeau's outside consultants to uh, Canadian families, costing uh, every Canadian family about $14 hundred dollars with the billions that he spent on outside consultants that two-person it staffing firm gc strategies they've received more than 60 million dollars in government contracts from justin trudeau just since 2017. this is the tip of the iceberg with the rot inside justin trudeau's government and we're going to keep working to expose the waste and the corruption with ghost contractors and no-show contractors and falsified documents to uh, bid up uh, the the price that these middlemen and these contractors are are receiving it's absolutely egregious while uh, Canadians are struggling to uh, feed themselves feed their families heat their homes and we have insiders lining their pockets in Ottawa so this is from the procurement ombudsman today with three quarters of the contractors on the arrive scam having done no work at all and we're still waiting to hear from the auditor general on this boondoggle so we'll hear from uh, from her over the next couple of weeks as well but we're going to keep digging into this in parliament you can count on that so thank you for watching this video share it and we're going to keep getting answers keep exposing the corruption waste and rot in Justin Trudeau's Ottawa. Okay, well, uh, time for Trudeau to go. Join me in a prayer to see him gone. 
Um, I moved my microphone up. Some people complaining about my sound. Give a thumbs up or let us know if it's any different. I, I moved it up on my lapel uh, for some reason. And somebody's also saying that yesterday's show needs a, a you know, to, to raise the volume and repost. A Facebook issue, you think? Yeah, it might be the platform that you're doing it on. Maybe they're just, you know, not not they, helping they us. Make it, they, they make it hard. Right, yeah. right. They 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 come after us anyway. They put blips in. Um, you know, they. I mean, we were taping earlier a show today that is for another day, and uh, I don't know something went horribly wrong. So we just feel like we're always getting attacked in some way. But uh, take a look at this. Woke activist Molly Brennan with mask in tow advocating for boys and girls locker rooms. Take a look. And I developed breasts during um, uh, puberty. So I'm a cisgender woman going through menopause. So I'm losing some of that strength. Um, so I'm generally in opposition to laws that uphold the extermination of minorities. And uh, this HB 1205 is a bite into the pursuit of happiness of trans kids. Uh, next to come will be another crunch into the liberty of trans kids and adults. And the main course or the final solution, and yes, I intentionally capitalize, final solution is a drooling, snarling chomp that ends the lives of all trans people in this state and the nation. People who can sit and listen to the testimony of actual trans people and stand on the side of this bill, I really question uh, their taste in judgment. Uh, Ohio and other states mentioned the 24 that have passed these bills. They follow them up. Uh, moving on to access to health care for kids. Moving on to access for health care for adults. Then they move on to bathroom use, public bathrooms, employment, and visibility in public. The safety issue here isn't largely that someone's cis daughter is going to lose out to a trans girl in sports. Statistically, the data isn't there, and I have that here. I'll give it to you so you can check it out. Um, and it isn't that she's going to be ruined for life by seeing a trans girl's penis in the locker room. In fact, statistically, that won't be the first penis she sees. The safety issue is a straight and narrow path to elimination of minorities, trans people, queer people, disabled people, Jewish people, black people, brown people, and a tightening definition of what is acceptable as man, woman, and human. The slippery slope is toward a future where everyone is looking over their shoulder as they point at each other trying to save themselves from being masticated out of existence by fascism. Sure. Please, minutes is up. please see the details of HB 396 going before the House on Thursday to prove my point. And please oppose this pro-death to trans kids bill. 1205, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, yeah, time's up, lady. Uh, listen, uh, we just have one thing to say. Keep your boys out of the women's bathrooms. We don't want them there. Boys with their parts are not allowed in girls' bathrooms. It's a biological reality, and we're sorry to hurt your feelings. You're going to have to get over it the same way that we don't want to be traumatized by seeing your boys' parts in our girls' bathrooms. And uh, absolutely disgusting. Another video, IDF soldier giving firsthand account on how Hamas uses UN-funded UR. UNRWA schools and buildings as military assets. You know, just two weeks in, we had, unfortunately, a, a bad day where we were advancing south. Uh, we were meant to take a new position. Um, we were moving towards Jabalia uh, from Beit Hanun, and it forced us to cross in front of an UNRWA school. Um, unfortunately, schools in the Gaza Strip, hospitals, places of worship, Things that we consider sanctuaries and off limits are uh, completely in bounds when you uh, put it in the context of Hamas. The rest of the firefight, I mean, right after that, I started to hear the AK 47s, and that was coming from the school. And after two to three minutes, I looked over at him and I made the conscious decision that if I uh, don't run out to him to try to save him, he's going to die. I ran, I sprinted, I got to him successfully. Um, but he's really heavy and as I'm trying to pull him up you know, I get maybe one or two feet on him and as I'm doing that I'm exposed and I'm static and the sniper is able to shoot me in my leg. 
And as I'm crawling, I got shot in my left leg and it went through muscle. And I got shrapnel in my right hip and in my lower right back, which are really dangerous places to get shrapnel. Search and rescue came, 669, it's the best search and rescue team in the world. They took me to Sheba, to this place where we're sitting right now. And, uh, and they were able to, to save my leg and my life. My officer was unfortunately killed. Um, he was killed before I ran out to him. Um, the bullet was a headshot. I just didn't see it. And he was already gone. So this is the problem. And we're going to be talking about Israel tomorrow and Friday um, at, you know, this uh, bit of war. Um, that is um, that is really being brought to the whole world. You know that it was three U.S. soldiers that were killed a couple of days ago, JT, in Jordan. And um, people calling for war, and, and I mean world war, with the U.S. getting involved in all of that. Um, this, is, this is the worst, you know, kind of thing that, that we do not want to see. But these people over there that hate Jews and hate Christians. We're going to be talking about this tomorrow and the next day. Um, th there are radical factions, and we're in a, a very tough, a very tough world. And um, so, stay with us and be with us tomorrow and the next day. My uh, website is laurelin.tv. Oh, I do. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We want to show you this. So, you know, those soggy paper straws that you get in the drive through. <laughs> so guess what? Not only are they not recyclable, they also contain toxic forever chemicals, which are harming us. The, the, the cardboard straws are not good for us. The paper straws that they disintegrate anyways, and then all those chemicals are getting inside of our bodies. Sick puppies, you know, like, I, I think it's Klaus Schwab. I think it's the globalists, right? They, oh, yeah, okay, how else can we kill them? Let's make, yeah, make them use, yeah, yeah, that's it. Make them use straws, paper straws, and, uh, yeah, yeah, put really nasty stuff, arsenic and stuff in there, and then just make them suck on the straws. That'll be good. That'll be good. They won't see it coming because, you know what, we don't want plastics. We don't want all those plastic straws taking up all that room in the landfills. Okay, now they're harming us. So please don't use pl the, the straws. Don't use the straws because they're, they're harmful to you. And tell everyone you want plastic straws back. Go on Amazon, buy your own plastic straws. <laughs> I think we even have a couple of metal ones, but I'm always worried how you really clean those puppies, you know. Yeah, dishwasher, okay. But how, how's a dishwasher going to get inside a straw? Really, it's the heat. Okay, you have an answer for everything, don't you, Ben? Okay, so yeah, I guess <laughs> I just, how do you get the water going through the straw? It's, it's like a, well, such a pain. But anyways, okay. Nice to be with you, laurelin.tv. Um, I'm really glad that uh, the only one that tells me what to say or not say is God and JT. And JT's been pretty good about things lately. So, so is God. God keeps giving me permission even to support Tucker. We got a guy in the... Uh, uh, you know, Terry Gain is out there. I don't know if you've left the show, but he's sad to see LLTT support, um, support the naive and myopic isolationist Tucker Carlson. Tucker's my hero. I don't know what to tell you, Terry. If, if Tucker's not your hero, I'm not sure why you're watching this show. Maybe go watch CBC, Global. Um, go. Yeah, they don't like Tucker. Terry, come on. What are you thinking? Tucker is for everything that is about freedom. And, you know, he lost his position at Fox because he just kept telling too much truth. I was worried about it. I even had said on this very show, you know, like he he's saying so much that you have this feeling he's going to be let go. In any case, if you like this kind of uh, programming, we like you. We're live on several channels every single day. Tell your friends, share, share, share. Why don't you just share this show out? It's going to be great to share on Chris Carver. Uh, Chris Barber and uh, everything that you know went on with uh, the the Freedom Convoy. I absolutely love it. I do have. Let's see. Do I have one more? JT, one more share. Guess who was at the Freedom Convoy? A guy I really love. This guy, right here. He was there with his wife. That is the lovely Catherine 
And uh, there's uh, Maxime Bernier and Catherine at the Freedom Convoy. When you didn't see many other people standing, there he was standing up for the people. And so I appreciate that. Anyways, I just want to brag about that because I still support, I really love Maxime. I hope that, uh, you know, we'll continue to see a rise. I hope that we could get one or two seats in the House to bring just accountability. Uh, they don't have to take over, but accountability in the House with someone with Maxime's voice uh, trying to end this mass immigration, um, trying to, you know, bring like a real conservative voice to our parliament, I think it would be good, but call me crazy. So if you're able to donate to us, I appreciate you. Thank you. You do get an income tax receipt because we bring the love and the power of God. We bring the insight of God into everyday shows. So there's a donate button that maybe JT might be so kind as to re-put back on the screen. Uh, there's a donate button, laurelin.tv, and you can donate a small amount, a large amount. The larger, the better. We love it. We need it. Thank you. Uh, but if you'd want to uh, join us to become a monthly partner, that would be absolutely fantastic. means a lot. You can also donate anonymously, and we won't know your name, and it's all private. So that's up to you. Another way is through eTransfer Laurelin Live at ProtonMail.com, and as well, by mail, Box 48184, New Westminster V3M00A7, and uh, we'd love to hear from you. So I'll just leave you today with something great. How about this? Do you know how important the tongue is? Oh, it's so important <laughs> that, you, that you be careful what you say. <laughs> oh, JT did not know where I was going, so he was like, all right, thanks for completing that. Um, it's so important what you say and how you use your voice. And James, um, you know, in James 3, it talks about taming the tongue. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. That's kind of scary, isn't it, eh? When you put yourself in that position where you're sharing your heart a lot, uh, that you have to make sure that you're sharing correctly, that you're sharing with honor, with character, with integrity, and that you're not being mean or cruel, and you're not misleading people. And that's what we never want to do here. We all stumble in many ways, it says in verse 2 of James 3, anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect and able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, boy, that seems loud, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes a great boast. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Have you ever said something and it just ignites a storm that you were not expecting? Have you ever had that happen, everybody? You know, your big mouth gets you in trouble. That happens with me sometimes. Sometimes JT too, right? You really put your foot in it. You know, and it, yeah, no, he, he's not appreciating that right now. But, uh, you know, maybe it's more me. Maybe it's for me, <laughs> but I, I definitely do. <laughs> oh, I've, I have done some doozies. <laughs> and the thing about words, it's kind of like this. Can I show you what words are like? They're like this. You speak a word. And once you've spoken the word, you can't take it back. You've got a big reaction to it. And no matter how you try to tape that or glue it, that piece of paper, that word, it's, it's never going to be the same. You've said it. It's done. You, you can't change it. And if you add to it and you add more words and you say more and more things that you shouldn't have said, I don't know. It can be a real mess. That's what words are like. And words can, can change the course and direction of a, a meeting. Have you ever been in the boardroom? Everybody's kind of on a course, and then there's that one guy that sits back. And he kind of says, well, I see it a little differently. 
and he might say a few things. Or maybe that's got, there's that guy that in a meeting loses his temper, right? You lose your temper and you utter words that are hurtful, painful, you can't take them back. You know, I, I've had problems. I've had issues with words in my life. And ironically, you know, this has sort of become my career in, in having a lot of words. And it's important that all of us ask that the Lord God be in charge of this smallest member, smallest muscle of our body, that it be kept in check. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow. You know, it's not easy to deliver the truth of what our sick world is doing, but for some of us, we feel that we have no choice. Because if we are silent about these abominable things, then we are letting evil go unchecked, and we cannot do that. For those of you wonderful people who are writing me and are sharing your encouragement, I am deeply grateful. Thank you for all the letters that you've been sending. Thank you for the donations and the support. I found out that in order to speak the truth, you have to become very, very strong. If you would go to my website at www.lauralyn.tv, you'll find all of the ways that you can contact me. Remember, my friends, all is well. All is well. Thanks for joining me.